director, as well as our education co-chairs, Gretchen Hilliard Boyce and Antonio Castillo. Uh, today's program is sponsored by our annual education sponsor, WJE, as well as our program sponsor, Groundwork Planning and Preservation. For those of you who may be less familiar with us in our work, the California Preservation Foundation is a 501c3 nonprofit organization committed to ensuring that the rich diversity of California's historic resources and its cultural heritage are identified, protected, and celebrated for their history and valuable role in California's economy, environment, and quality of life. Our work is made possible by the generous support of our members, donors, and sponsors, and we invite you to join this preservation community by going to californiapreservation.org slash membership. Our website is also where you can find information on upcoming programs and events of ours. Uh, for today's webinar, we are joined by architectural historian Christina Dykus. Christina is principal and the director of the Cultural Resources Planning Studio at Firm Page and Turnbull. Thank you, Christina, for joining us today. Uh, Christina will be further introduced by today's moderator and our program sponsor, education co-chair Gretchen Hilliard Boyce. Gretchen is a historian and preservation planner with over 20 years of experience working in the public and private sectors and is the founder of Groundwork Planning and Preservation, a cultural resources consulting practice providing a full range of historical and cultural resource consulting services. Uh, for our audience, if at any time during the program you have questions for our speakers, we encourage you to put it into the chat box. Um, we've set aside approximately 30 minutes at the end of this program for questions, and we'll do our best to get to everyone's in the time allotted. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Gretchen to get today's program underway. Great. Thanks, Lisa. I'm really thrilled to kick off this series today. It's something um, we started talking about on the Education Committee a few months ago, thinking about what CPF programs look like in a post-pandemic world with the realization that we're not really doing as many networking events as we used to. And, you know, we saw a need to provide more opportunities, not, such, not just at the annual conference, but throughout the year for kind of like emerging and seasoned professionals to interact and connect and learn from each other. So we're so thrilled today to have Christina Dykus be our first uh, presenter, speaker, person we're going to talk to. Um, Christina is based in San Francisco, close to where she grew up and is an architectural historian and director of Page and Turnbull's Cultural Resources Planning Studio. She just became principal of the firm in January of 2024. Um, in her work, she values the sense of place, historical perspective, and sustainability inherent in cultural resource management and historic preservation. Over her 16 plus year career so far, she has prepared and led numerous projects involving historic resource evaluations, neighborhood and citywide historic surveys, section 106 consultation project, excuse me, consultation projects, historic resource chapters of general plans and specific plans, design guidelines, and other planning documents. She particularly enjoys interpretive programming and assisting clients with improving their historic preservation programs. Christina has been a volunteer for the California Preservation Foundation for many years. She's presented at educational workshops and conferences, led walking tours, and helped to organize eight annual conferences as a member of the conference programs committee. She's been on CPF's Board of Trustees since 2018, and in that capacity was co-chair of the Education Commission Committee and chair of Doors Open last year. And before she terms off the board this year, she's doing one more big role as serving as VP of Programs for the organization. Um, today, Christina will start with a short presentation outlining her career path to date, and then I'll interview her with a series of questions, and we'll end with a Q&A from you all. Now, please do feel free to enter your questions in the chat box as we go. And if you have other ideas for speakers or professionals that you'd like to see highlighted in this series, please do send those names. You can just send them in the chat to any of us with CPF, Lisa, John, Antonio, or I. And with that, Christina, the floor is yours. Thanks, Gretchen. I'm very excited to be the first <laughs> excited, maybe a little nervous, hoping to set a good standard for this series of um, emerging professionals mentorship programs. So um, as Gretchen said, I have a short presentation about um, how I got into historic preservation and what my career has been looking like so far. And then um, I will be happy to answer questions that Gretchen has and anybody else after that. So um, let me pull up my presentation. All right. 
So I am going to immediately date myself as I look back in time, um, thinking about how I got into historic preservation and architectural history. So it kind of starts here uh, in the mid to late 90s <laughs> when I was a middle schooler. Um, and while many preteen girls were plastering their walls with pictures of boy bands uh, and a young Leonardo DiCaprio, um, I was really into Anne of Green Gables and other books by Ellen Montgomery um, and uh, historical fiction that I was reading at the time and this sort of romantic ideal of a coastal landscape, which got me very interested in lighthouses. I had a relative, <laughs> had an obsession with lighthouses. I was plastering my walls with uh, posters of lighthouses. Um, and I really kind of uh, find my origins of my interest in architectural history at around this time. Um, this is a picture of me when I was about 13, I think, braces and all. Uh, and I was um, reading books about lighthouses. I just thought they were really interesting. Um, growing up in the Bay Area, there, there are several that are uh, convenient to where I was living and um, my parents would take little day trips or weekend trips along the coast so we could visit them. And I was also a really creative kid. Uh, and so I would um, take photos with my camera or I would sit there and draw them. Um, so these are a couple of pictures um, from, it looks like 1996 and maybe 1997 when I was in middle school um, drawing some of these lighthouses. So one of them is, um, on the right is Montero Lighthouse, which is just north of Half Moon Bay in the Bay Area, and the other one is in Big Sur. So I loved that there were beautiful settings. The structures and the technology of the lenses were really interesting to me, as well as kind of the settings of the outbuildings and the Victorian era or older houses that the lighthouse keepers lived in. Um, and I would get books about the histories of their um, the lighthouse keepers lives and, you know, all of that. Uh, and really that kind of eventually just expanded into a broader interest in um, in buildings, in their history and what they mean to uh, us and our culture and so on. So from this time, I went to college eventually, <laughs> I went to UCLA and uh, I had continued interest in art and history. Um, I had taken a class when I was in high school in psychology. And so I didn't quite know what I wanted to do, um, but I figured that UCLA could cover many of <laughs> those potential topics. So I went in undeclared. I ended up taking um, an intro to sociology class and really liked it, you know, how people kind of um, uh, social norms and how we interact with each other was pretty interesting to me. Um, so I ended up majoring in sociology, but by my second year, I, um, I did start taking, uh, I had started a, a minor in museum studies, which was in the art history program. And I kind of had to cobble it together. Um, there were a few, uh, classes that were offered, but not as many as I would have liked. And so I ended up starting to go to the history department and taking classes there. And um, there was another department called World Arts and Cultures, and they were offering classes that kind of had intersections with museum studies, including um, uh, there was one on world fairs, and so that was very much about kind of how countries are representing themselves, not only in their objects and industry, but also in the buildings that kind of represented their culture. And um, sometime during that period, I had a summer internship uh, with the city of Redwood City, and I was trying to remember, this is 20 years ago now, um, how the heck I ended up in this <laughs> In the summer internship, I think I may have had uh, a connection to the planning director at the time. Um, Redwood City is the city right next to my hometown of San Carlos. Um, and so, you know, it wasn't too far off the, the beaten path of um, my, my hometown connections. But 
I worked on a project there um, to kind of identify the historic character of neighborhoods throughout Redwood City. And the idea that the city planning director was interested in was creating some kind of design criteria for character compatibility. Um, it's funny to look back at it now because I really didn't know the profession or exactly what I was doing, but um, but what I was doing is kind of in a way what I'm still doing today. So I, I love the, that there's that um, tracking of uh, my career trajectory. Um, I actually found the document in my computer on my laptop uh, that I had produced for that internship. So this is a little snippet where I was identifying the different kinds of architectural styles and, and building types and what you might find um, in every neighborhood of the city. Um, and, uh, and I also found a personal statement that I had written when I was applying to grad school about this experience. So I thought I would just read that. I think it's like a little window into where I was at the time. So I said that I completed a character study in which I described specific architectural attributes of the city's neighborhoods in order to create a sound definition of the character of each. Planners will use this information to decide if the remodeling plans that residents bring to them are harmonious with the appearance of the surrounding neighborhood. More recently, I've used this idea of neighborhood character as a basis for my sociology honors thesis. So I was able to kind of connect it back to my undergrad major. Um, and I used Redwood City as the case study. I was researching, re researching whether people find a heightened sense of stability and community in an older neighborhood with defined character and how social tensions are manifested between long-term residents and newcomers who are looking to rebuild. So kind of the uh, mini McMansion um, trend that was definitely happening around that time and still does today. Uh, this exposure has spawned an interest in the aspects of European architecture that influenced American design and also the way that American architecture shapes and is shaped by social phenomena. So I was already starting to kind of put these ideas together without really any formal education yet at this time. Uh, I think I was, I know I had a, a book on historic preservation and I was doing a lot of self-education Clearly, I was already kind of getting an understanding of architectural styles on my own. So I think I was checking out books from the library or buying them and um, educating myself. But uh, it ends up that there were a few classes at UCLA that were offered that I was able to tie to that museum studies minor, I think. Um, and one of them, was, or two of them were taught by this professor, Tom Hines, who I understand is still around. Today, he's probably in his 80s now. I feel like he was maybe in the 60s then. Um, and he taught a history of American architecture that was in the history department. Um, and this was in the spring of my junior year. So it took some time through undergrad to start getting into this. Um, and then I followed that with a history of architecture and urban design that was in, I think, the planning um graduate program that was prehistory to Baroque in my senior year, and then a follow-up uh, to the first one by Tom Hines, a history of modern American architecture uh, in the winter of my senior year. And I definitely read some of these books that he wrote. I have this orange Burnham of Chicago about Daniel Burnham. Uh, we definitely talked about Irving Gill. He also wrote a book about um, uh, not Schindler, but another one of the LA um, modern architects that I'm just blanking on right now. Uh, anyway, it was a really great foundation and solidified, this is what I want to do. This is what I at least want to study. Uh, so from there, um, I went straight to grad school. I, I decided in undergrad that I needed to study more of this. Uh, and I, you know, I'd only had a few opportunities uh, in at yeah, UCLA, so I applied to a few schools, and I got into um, University of Virginia with their architectural history department. I got a certificate in historic preservation, um, but I think it's enlightening again in this personal statement to UVA when I was applying 
this was uh, the fall of my senior year, that I said, I have decided I want to study architectural history in graduate school so that I can apply such knowledge and research to a future career in city planning, building restoration, or neighborhood preservation. I'm also completing a minor in museum studies, a subject that has introduced me to art history and possible careers as a curator of a museum or historical site. I hope my work can help establish a balance between the architectural integrity of our neighborhoods and historic buildings and the development necessary for forward thinking society. Um, I think what this kind of indicates is that I actually didn't really know what I wanted to do for my career yet. I knew I really was interested in the history of architecture and all of the, the cultural connections related to that, the economic and political trends, fashion, um, you know, all kinds of other influences that we, that influence architecture and that architecture influences um, society. But I didn't know if I wanted to go into museum work or house museum or historic preservation planning or something like that. So that's the reason I went into a graduate program for architectural history instead of historic preservation masters. But here I am, I ended up in um, historic preservation anyway. And um, that is partly because I went all the way across the country to the East Coast to study in Virginia. And little did I know when I did that, that there were connections back to California and to San Francisco through the alumni network at UVA. So I was able to um, first start out with what's called an externship through UVA, which was like a two week um, kind of shadowing experience, non-paid, where you just go to a company and get a sense of what they do and how they work and they give you a few tasks and things. And uh, so since I grew up in the Bay Area, I was able to come back home and go to Page and Turnbull's office in San Francisco for those couple of weeks. Um, and then I was able to get a summer internship that next summer in the middle of my two graduate uh, school years interning for Page and Turnbull. So these are some of the folks, this was this picture is from when I was um, interning in 2006 that I found. It was kind of an amazing trip down memory lane to pull this <laughs> presentation together. Um, and several of these folks, uh, Christopher Plank and Rich Sucre and Elizabeth Milnerick and Alejandro Huerta were UVA grads um, working or interning at Page and Turnbull at the time. And Cor Cora Palmer, there's actually a lot of UVA in this picture, yeah. Uh, so I was really lucky with that. Um, I finished up my graduate program at UVA, and then I had one more internship at Colorado Preservation Inc., which is the statewide nonprofit, kind of like CPF, um, but in Colorado. And I had a particular project I was working on, which was to survey and write documentation forms for New Deal era buildings in the Eastern Plains. Um, so I have a couple of pictures there, this really neat um, kind of streamlined uh, pool house, and there were schools and libraries and town halls and other public um, buildings that were constructed in the 1930s that were still in use in these tiny towns on the plains. It was a really great experience. Um, and I was getting to the end of the summer and planning to go back home and just look for jobs anywhere in the country. I was open to living elsewhere. And I got a call from Rich Sucre at Page and Turnbull saying that uh, one of their full-time staff was had just put in her notice and would I be interested in a full-time job? Um, so I ended up saying yes. And starting maybe a week or two after I, I finished up this internship uh, and I have been there ever since. So my story is one of um, finding a great situation and sticking with it forever, it seems. Um, and so this is a, just a snapshot of my uh, my trajectory through the company. Uh, I certainly have some really great friends throughout the years who I've worked with who have gone on to do other things. And it's interesting to compare our, our careers and our trajectories, um, one of whom is Gretchen here. Uh, but I, I started as you know a junior architectural historian, and then I became an associate and a senior associate. And around the time of becoming a senior associate, I got in, more into project management. So my trajectory through 
the company has been that I really started with a ton of working on historic survey work and research, being the primary author of a lot of different types of reports for a good nine years or so. Um, since 2016 or so, I've been doing more and more project management, managing other people in the company, um, preparing proposals, getting more involved in the business development of bringing in work, um, doing a lot of peer review, copy edits, QA, QC of reports. Um, and, you know, at that point, you really have to have a good handle on what the clients are expecting, what the level of effort needs to be and all of that. Um, which takes time to learn as you're advancing in your career. And um, now that I have become a, a director of our cultural resources planning studio, and most recently as a principal, I've really been focusing, been trying to focus not just on projects like project manager would, but also on people, on um, learning about how to support the staff that um, that are working with me and um, and now learning about operating a business and business development. Um, and uh, so, you know, it's constant learning experience if you're open to the whole kind of trajectory of what you can do in your career. Um, so I would say that uh, going through this, this is my last, oh no, I have a couple more slides. Um, but it's been interesting to kind of think back through how I got to where I am because um, I, you know, I'm still doing it and still passionate about it and enthusiastic about it. And, um, and it's interesting that I can kind of trace that back to these little nascent interests from when I was 11 or 12 years old. Um, just a couple of other things. Now that I'm doing a lot more management in my company, I do miss being able to actively do historic research. Uh, you know, the, that's like the fun stuff that you get to do in, in the job. Um, but I, I satisfy that in other ways too. So I'm, uh, I love to take photos. I have this website here. I love to travel and experience places and historic architecture all over the world. And I've also been since the, the depths of COVID in the summer of 2020, uh, working on writing a young adult historical fiction novel. This is a picture of the Panama Pacific International Exposition that was in San Francisco in 1915, and that's kind of the basis of the story. And there's a definite historic preservation angle to this story, so um, I'm I'm hoping I'm working on this, on, you know, on my on the side, um, but I'm hoping that eventually I'll be able to get this published and be able to do this alongside the work that I do in my uh, kind of further developing my career. So that is the conclusion to my presentation. I will stop sharing. Thanks, Christina. I love seeing the old photos. <laughs> Very cute. Um, <laughs> so just a reminder, everyone, please put your questions in the chat because I have questions for Christina, but I'm more interested to hear what all you want to know. Um, one thing before we go into the questions, I wondered if you could explain what it means to be a principal, because I feel like that's a concept that like people might not even understand what that means when you when you get to that level in a firm. Sure. Yeah. So another word for it is a partner, uh, like law firms have partners and really so Page and Turnbull is a architecture slash planning firm. And a lot of architecture firms are kind of set up like law firms where you have owners, select number of owners of the company, and you buy shares of the company in this kind of closed system and um, as you advance into leadership. So um, I'm a, a part owner now and a leader. And so in my company, we call them principals, um, but some may call them partners. Thanks. I think it was interesting looking at your, I think it was like a screenshot from your LinkedIn profile. It's like you started out as your first entry level position and you were in that position for four years. And then you sort of started making these bumps up every about two years. And I know like I'm very different. Like I moved around about every four or five years to a different position. So it, I just think that's important for people that are maybe like new to the field or figuring out if they want to go into like an architecture firm side of things, but like to see that you know, people that do stay with a company do rise up through the ranks over time, but it takes time. And, you know, 
you stuck through basically the whole trajectory from intern to principal, which is the highest, <laughs> you know, other than being the president of the company, that's the highest level they can get. Yeah. So just think that's important, important to point and out. Maybe, maybe president is in my future. We'll see. <laughs> yeah, you never know. I'm just stay, stick around long enough. Yeah. <laughs> um, so one question I have is just talking about like skills overall. So you're an architectural historian and a planner and what kind of like personal and professional skills do you think are most beneficial for that kind of a role? And did you learn them in school or did you learn them on the job? Yeah, great, great um, question. I would say writing skills are really important for the work that I do as an architectural historian and cultural resources planner. We write a lot of technical reports for writing historical accounts. And the other thing is having an analytical mind. Um, you know, pulling that historic research together and putting the puzzle pieces together and kind of thinking outside the box sometimes and how you can, uh, what the information is telling you or where you can find additional information is really important for the work that I do. And I would say that I probably learned, I started to learn that certainly um, in school. Uh, I always enjoyed writing and was a, a, a pretty strong writer, um, but I've certainly honed all of those skills in the, on the job. And there's a lot to learn on the job. And I think that's important to, to know. Um, uh, let's see, I, I wrote some, a few notes of things to maybe discuss. Um, Analyzing proposed projects using the Secretary of the Interior standards and providing design consultation, which are things that I do in my job. Those are definitely learned skills and take a lot of experience. The more projects you do, the more kind of different types of um, situations and properties and people you're working with that you have, the more you learn from all of them. Um, and uh, and having a variety of, of people that you're working with as clients um, sometimes finding yourself in sticky situations, uh, on occasion can be challenging, but you know, there, then you, you definitely learn something from all of those. So I think any of us who have been in the field for a while, you know, there's always, there's some sticky situation that happens, whether it's, um, the finding that you make about historic significance or your opinion about a project and what needs to happen with it. You're part of this urban planning process. Um, there can be some times where things get a little bit tough and you have to work through them. Thank you. I see there's lots of great questions coming in. One of, <laughs> one of the questions is similar to one of my questions. So I'll ask a combination here. Um, so Vinny was asking what have been the most rewarding parts of your experience in this field? And that was kind of one of my things was like, what is rewarding about your job? Yeah. Well, um, one thing that I think anybody that I work with would agree with is that we all are really curious and love to learn. And the, the job constantly allows for self-education because if you're doing historic research, if you're into that, you're always, for every project, you're learning about the history of that place uh, or that property. And um, I've definitely become like a walking tour guide with so much random facts <laughs> about places, um, which is kind of fun. Uh, so I think I, I've constantly felt that kind of um, self-fulfillment in the work that I do just from like a kind of um, academics mind. Um, and then certainly being able to produce good projects to contribute to, um, you know, adaptive reuse projects or, you um, or help cities to figure out what are their historic resources and what do they want to do with them. I've I've really been enjoying working on larger teams, but focusing on um, general plans and specific plans where cities are envisioning what is their whole city or a certain area of their city going to look like in the next 20 years and how do they get there and um, be able to help them uh, kind of understand the values of the community and um, incorporate education about the history of their city and recognize their historic resources and celebrate them at the same time that they're balancing um, growth and needing to deal with housing pressures and other things like that. So it feels rewarding to be in the room and having those conversations and really helping as the, the expert in this particular um, topic. Uh, and then I'll just say that now yeah. that I'm 
more in leadership. It's been really rewarding to be um, part of mentorship and educating younger people. So that was one of the reasons I was very happy to be part of this presentation today. I try to do this all the time. And it's the same reason I'm writing this young adult novel, trying to, you know, hopefully inspire young people to be um, interested in this career path or its general topic. Yeah, and kind of in that thread, like who helped you along the way? Like who were your, I mean, were there specific people, professors, bosses, like who, who was your mentor or yeah. is your mentor? I haven't had just one, I don't think. Um, it's been people uh, across my whole education and career trajectory, I would say. Um, uh, you know, I had the initial inspiration when I was in college, but I don't know that I quite had a mentor at that time. Um, but certainly professors in my graduate program, um, Richard Guy Wilson, uh, who was the chair, and um, Daniel Bluestone, he taught the historic preservation planning classes, um, you know, certainly helped. And then I would say that the internships that I had both at Page and Turnbull and Cal Colorado Preservation Inc., whoever my um, uh, um, advisors were, were really influential because they were so kind in, you know, sharing with me their own career trajectories and what I could do and what I needed to know and what I should learn and all of that, that that was really helpful. Um, and then since I've been in my at my company for all these years, I would say kind of equal parts, the more senior staff, the project managers who worked with me and reviewed my work and, and taught me so much um, and the company leadership, as well as my peers. Uh, you know, I think we've all learned together and I have many friends that um, that I've worked with over the years, and it's hard to get together and not talk shop. <laughs> <laughs> when, we, when we do about, you know, we're all working, doing different things now, but we're always talking about the projects we're working on and the challenging clients we're working with and, and various things like that. Um, mm -hmm. So I think it's really been a, a community effort. Um, and then one other thing is being involved in CPF has been so, so wonderful because there are people of all different backgrounds with an interest in historic preservation that I've gotten to know. Um, really interesting and uh, thoughtful folks and having, being able to have the opportunity to get that kind of perspective outside of the architecture planning firm perspective that I work in has been uh, really valuable. Mm -hmm. um, you kind of started to touch on this, but I'm going to go to Holly's question, which is what were some of the most difficult points of your career journey or just like you kind of were talking about that a little bit. You're like, oh, when things get tough, but like, what does that look like? <laughs> what is tough about it? Oh man, I'm trying to think of some specific, um, specific examples. I mean, there have been specific projects I've worked on that have been hard. Okay, well, here's one right now. Um, I have a couple projects that involve I a uh, survey and evaluation of um, either historic neighborhoods as a historic district uh, or individual houses with the idea that we would like to try to designate them and help protect the character of the neighborhood. And that's really coming, um, it's really being challenged by residents who are concerned about their property values and property rights and what they can do with their properties. Um, as well as lately a kind of narrative that identifying any historic resources after state housing laws have been enacted is like automatically um, being done in, in purposefully to thwart the state housing laws. And I just don't think that's necessarily the case. Um, so there's been a lot of pushback on these types of projects lately. <clears throat> and that requires a lot of educating the public. Um, but, uh, you know, it, 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 that doesn't necessarily make it any easier. It's just something you have to work through and um, navigate as you're going through the, the projects. Yeah, it's kind of like the issues are so much more complex than the public discourse makes it seem. And then yeah. it's easy to point fingers when it's so complicated how all of this stuff is intertwined, like housing yeah. policy and preservation and everything and, else. And 
the hard thing about historic preservation, the way I see it is it's a community benefit and it's a long-term benefit. And that's hard to convey to individual property owners who, you know, understandably care about their own investments um, and the period of time in which they are owners or what they're going to get out of it. Um, and so it's almost like, it's like apples and oranges. It's hard to talk, you know, it's, it's hard to have a, a conversation about that because the values are and the perspective is so different. Yeah. Um, I'm going to go to Desiree's question because there's three thumbs ups on it, which means other people want to hear it. So she <laughs> asks, um, if someone is not in the historic preservation field currently, but works adjacent to it in environmental compliance, mm -hmm. do you have any suggestions on where to start to acquire historic preservation knowledge and skills, like such as certificate programs or specific geared trainings that you've heard of? Great question. Um, CPF, certainly uh, the education programs through CPF on the Secretary of the Interior Standards and uh, and CEQA, specifically historic resources, um, are a really good uh, source. There's also um, an organization called the National Preservation Institute, NPI, um, that some, I get emails all the time for programs that they're putting on. Um, gosh, are there others? Maybe Gretchen, maybe you can think of others like that. Um, mm. There's a lot happening all the time. I think like yeah. the California Shippo, they just put out their newsletter today. They do it like maybe monthly and they actually listed like CPS programs and then some stuff happening with the advisory council and historic preservation. So I think just getting on yes. a lot of those lists, like the state Shippo's list, the CPF's list, mm -hmm. they, they will help you like aggregate all those other opportunities too, that you might not find individually. Yeah, um, I think anything that can give you experience doing historic research and understanding the uh, criteria for evaluating uh, properties using the National Register of Historic Places and California Register of Historical Resources criteria is important, as well as understanding the Secretary of the Interior Standards. Um, primarily the standards for rehabilitation, which is what we use when we're analyzing proposed projects for whether they would cause a, uh, an impact on the environment as part of the CEQA process. So any opportunities to um, get some experience doing that would help. And then you could potentially, you know, if you're, if you're able to get some of that experience in a broader environmental planning firm, um, then you may be able to you know, transition if you're interested into um, working for a more of a specialty firm. Um, you know, my my company combines that planning work with architectural design, which is an interesting kind of, we do a lot of the same stuff as environmental firms, but also some other things. Um, the other trajectory that some people take is to go into, a, you know, a planning department that has preservation planning staff. Um, or nonprofits. And so there's a lot of different directions you can go. Um, but going into the planning uh, planning department direction, you may need um, more specific training in uh, historic preservation planning to be able well, to- Well, what about too, like, what about like the higher level graduate level degrees? I know in the past, mm -hmm. a lot of places, firms, planning departments, they wouldn't even, like the minimum qualification for an entry level job is a master's degree in preservation history related field. Like, is that, are you still seeing that? Is that still what Page and Terminal requires or? Yeah. Do you require um, people that maybe have had work experience that equates to that. Right. Yeah. I think work experience um, can equate to that. Uh, I know we try to be a little bit broader. So we can include history, public history, um, urban urban uh, studies. Um, so, you know, you don't necessarily have to have a historic preservation or architectural history degree, but somehow it's very helpful to have had at least internships or other experience with, with historic preservation and architectural history so that you understand, for example, um, architectural styles and be able to identify them and write an architectural description. Um, that's kind of like the 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 basics um, and, uh, you know, conduct historic research. Um, and a lot can be taught on the job, but it's uh, it's helpful to have some um, some basic understanding 
coming into it uh, than kind of starting with no um, no relevant either education or work experience. So like for me, the internship opportunities were really important. And I would say that's the case with other people that we've hired. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know that internships too can be like a bridge if you're looking at a career change, for example, you might, you know, not everyone can do that. Not everyone can like leave a full-time job to go do an internship, but if Mm -hmm. it sometimes can give you enough work experience to then get your foot in the door at a place that you don't have the educational degree. And there's certainly a lot of self-education, like there's, you know, there's a lot of material out there on um, the basics of historic preservation and um, architectural styles like Lee and McAllister book and um, and other things like that, that can help um, if you don't have as much direct career experience, but you're trying to transition. Mm-hmm. Um, Karen had a follow-up to Desiree's question saying, you know, their firm has a number of folks who've worked in architecture and historic renovation for years. And do we have um, education recommendations for those newer to the specific architectural historian work? Um, Like other than, you know, CPF obviously is top of the list, but like Mm -hmm. it's kind of specialty thing, right? Like, you know, it's. Yeah, Yeah, um, that's a good question. Gosh, I don't know. And I, um, I know also, let's just say, Elsa had some ideas on um, the Historic Preservation Education okay. Fund, Society of Architectural Historians, which they are great. They are very academic, but definitely mm-hmm. that would touch that like architectural history thing. And also looking at PreserveNet for like, you know, they post job postings and yeah. internships. Yes, yes. Yeah. Um, we always post our. <laughs> oh, and then, okay, this is good. Everyone's answering these questions. So Evan says, good, that, good. which is, which I know this. I'm not looking at the Q&A. There's so a great, great. <laughs> fundamental summer course at US, USC in Heritage Conservation, as well as their graduate certificate program. And I know the summer course is meant to be like, kind of like a boot camp, like okay, good. Quick start. So that, that is a great program. And Evan, Excellent. thank you for posting the link too. And Evan says, happy to chat with anyone interested or point them in the right direction. Great. Yeah. I mean, I know that there are extension courses at various places like Gretchen, you used to teach an extension course at UC Berkeley for cultural landscapes. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, we have a friend who's taking one right now, you know, she's working full time, but she's doing her own kind of personal education. Um, So there may be a lot of opportunities like that. And one thing I'll say is compared to when I went to grad school, there are so many more historic preservation programs now in different Mm -hmm. colleges across the country than there used to be. Uh, And so that's, that's really wonderful. Um, And there are more kind of remote courses or programs too than there used to be when I was looking as well. So I think there are more Mm -hmm. opportunities these days than there used to be. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm going to move on, but people should look at the chat because there's everyone. Thank you for putting in all the resources. There's lots of good links in there. (laughs) So definitely read through that. Um, if I, I could just interject on. to Gretchen, yeah, following yeah. this uh, following this program, I'll be sending an email out to all attendees and I'll make sure to grab all the information provided here in the chat. Ah, thanks, Lisa. That's great. Um, I'm going to move on to Melody's question. How can one learn more administrative skills such as writing grants, which I'm not sure you do that at mm-hmm. Page and Turnbull, but like, what about like project management and people management? And yeah, like... yeah I can't, I can't speak much to grants. Um, I think more nonprofit organizations work on grants. Um, So if you're interested in learning more about that, it probably wouldn't hurt just to reach out to some organizations about how they do it and what they do and see if you can have like an informational interview and learn more about that. Or like Um, Lisa and John can interject if they want to. (laughs) Because I know they do this a lot. Uh, for the administrative side of operating in an architecture and planning firm, um, we have uh, we have various like computer programs that help us with our staffing of projects um, and also connect to our accounting and timesheet software. So we're able to put in our projects information, all of the subtasks, the amount of budget we have, because it's always about schedule deadlines and budget and hitting all of those um it's it's tough it's one of the other things you learn on the job is like how to do enough because <laughs> you can always do more research what is enough for the purpose of the project um and uh and so we, we the do, budget <laughs> yeah exactly so we do have tools to try to track that 
um, stay within the hours and the budget and the project manager kind of is in charge of, of all of that. Um, and, uh, and then we have to do invoices. Uh, so that's a whole thing when you're working for a, a company, private company, um, where, you know, we have to get paid. And so every month, uh, we, um, look at how much we've spent, uh, based on the, the hourly rates that all of our staff have. And then write a little note about what we've accomplished and, you know, um, send that off to the clients to get to get paid. So that's always a chunk of my time at the beginning of every month. Um, but I've also, uh, as I've mentioned, I've I've been doing like one on ones every other month with staff in my department. And I've been trying to do it's more like let's not talk about projects unless that's what you want to talk about. What what can how how are you doing in your career? How are you feeling? Um, what can I help you with? Uh, you know, it could be tools and technology topics. It could be, um, you know, scheduling and, and other things. And uh, so that's, that's like an aspect of the job that I didn't think about when I was starting out, um, mm -hmm. but that I personally find fulfilling. And so if you're open to that, as you get farther along in your career, I think um, it's something to kind of uh, uh, embrace um, and just something to, to keep in mind as you are kind of looking ahead to where you may be in another 10, 20 years. Um, I'm, I skipped Michelle's question early on, but I think it's a good one to ask right now, which is like, what does your day-to-day -day look like? And I want you to answer it mm -hmm. when you first started out versus mm -hmm. now. Like <laughs> when you first started out, what did your day-to-day -day look like? Yeah. When I first started out, let's say like the first year of my job at, at Page and Turnbull, I was working on basically one project, which was this huge survey of um, the mission in so many neighborhoods in San Francisco. So uh, I was um, going out um, doing the survey work several days a week. I think it was like thousands of properties. We had tablets um, kind of rudimentary compared to the survey applications we're using today. Um, but we're still, you know, at the forefront of technology at the time. This was like 2007. And then I was coming back to the office and writing DPR forms. So the, um, the historic survey forms for all of these properties. And I was spending most of my time doing that. And when I wasn't working on that project, I was working on historic resource evaluations. Um, so I was, you know, there was an individual property, somebody had a project, they needed to find out if it had historic significance. So I was doing site visits. Um, this was in San Francisco and then throughout the Bay Area, we have a pretty wide region. Um, so I was driving around, uh, going to the local, you know, libraries and um, planning departments and county assessors to do all the historic research and then coming back to the office and pulling it together. Uh, into the historic reports um, before they were sent out to the clients. So that was like all I was working on. I was 100%. Like, yeah, I was going to say nearly 100% billable, right? You're yeah, I was working overhead. on projects yeah. for all of my time, except for like a once a week, one hour department meeting, I think, and a once a month all staff meeting. Um, these days I am, the project work I'm doing is more on the kind of supervisory end. And so I, you know, I, this is what I do kind of every day for different, different amounts every day. Um, and I'm writing proposals for new work several days a week. And I'm um, working on, and I'm now I'm in principal meetings, which are <laughs> several hours a week uh, talking about kind of the bigger picture uh, business, business stuff. stuff. Right. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Okay. Um, a couple people have asked about your favorite projects, and I want to read Elsa's mm -hmm. question because Elsa asks, are there any key projects of your career at Page and Tremble that have shaped your work, or is there any project that you're particularly proud of? Yeah, um, I would say, okay, here's a fun one. This was quite a while ago when I was in that work, you know, not doing any management, just working on stuff all the time around 2009 or 10. And we had some projects for NASA out in the um, Mojave Desert with these uh, huge antenna dishes that communicated with unmanned spacecraft like the Mars rovers. Um, and it was just a super interesting visit trip. I had to go there a couple of times. There were like tortoises and donkeys out in the desert and it was really remote and weird. I kind of felt like you're on Mars. Mm -hmm. um, and then 
I learned about stuff I never thought I would in architectural history, like the way that the antenna dishes were mounted and, <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, but it was it was pretty fascinating. So I I always think of that one. Um, Isn't gosh. that the one that you then got like interviewed for a documentary because of this? Was that oh, the yeah. one, or you had well, this like yeah. nuanced knowledge that you could speak to about? I forgot space. that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I was in a documentary that came out in 2018, documentary film about an artist who was a space artist. So he was like in the 1960s before we NASA went to mars and the, or the moon rather um we the, this artist was kind of illustrating what rocket scientists at the time were envisioning the surface of the moon or mars or the outer space to look like and it was all part of the kind of post-war space and uh, imagination um and so i ended up being connected to the the filmmaker through some projects that i had had worked on and um had been published and were available online uh yeah look a fun fun little side thing though. yeah and then I'll say like a recent project that I really enjoyed and I feel proud of is um in Monterey there's a, a walking path called the path of history and it's really focused on kind of the like Spanish Mexican eras that is the history that Monterey leans into but the city got a grant to expand that and explore other communities. Like there's a Japanese, a Chinese community, an Italian Portuguese fishermen, more from like the early 20th century. And so we did a project to um, propose an addition to that walking path that told these other more diverse um, stories and kind of broader representation of the people who influenced the development of the city of Monterey. And that and other projects that I've been working on that are like that historic context statements focusing on African-American you know, history or, or that type of thing, um, those have been really inspiring and to work with local communities too to tell those stories has been really inspiring. And that's really been in the last few years, but I'm, I'm really happy about the direction that our field is going in. Um, and I'm, and I feel very, um, uh, I'm, I'm glad to be a, a part of that in whatever small way I am. Mm -hmm. Um, so who else do you collaborate with in the field besides like architecture and planning folks and like Cameron's question asked like, you know, economic development, real estate, question mark. Like, I know it's a lot of different types. Of yeah. People, so list I mean, them off. Yeah. <laughs> um, just as an example, when we're working on, let's say a general plan project, um, we're usually, I'm a sub consultant to a, an urban planning firm. That's kind of the overarching um, consultant working on that project. And then there are a, a lot of other team players with specialties like transportation planning and economics or like retail specialists. If there's maybe like a, an emphasis on the revitalization of downtown or something, um, real estate, um, gosh, what else? Uh, I don't know. I'm, I'm blanking on other things, but yeah, there's architecture, like, yeah. Um, uh, yeah. Um, all kinds of different disciplines that come together in planning projects. Um, same with CEQA, even in environmental, you know, review, you have a lot of specialists, um, that may or may not be, um, in-house for the prime environmental consultant. Uh, mm -hmm. And so we're just kind of one of the the pieces of those bigger pictures, but it's nice to be able to have this expertise and plug in and have discussions that are much broader than our particular field, but mm -hmm. all are important. All right, I'm keep going. There's so many questions. So I'm going to keep going. Um, <laughs> okay. how do, Evan's asking, how do you prepare for, how did you prepare for your transition into, I'll say project management first and then people management since that was sort of mm -hmm. Did you have um, any training? Did you have like project management training or yeah, I mean training? Yeah, in in house. Um, but so I and other people who are now kind of behind me and becoming project managers, we try to start small. So, can you manage yourself? Like you are the primary author of a report that the type that you've been working on for several years already. 
um, now you are the primary contact for the client and um, learning how to do the invoices for those smaller projects and learning how to write the proposals for those smaller projects. So we start small and this is what happened with me kind of in the area of familiarity, the, the projects you're working on when you're kind of just managing yourself and then kind of slowly growing from there into more complicated proposal work, potentially larger teams with more, um, more of your staff uh, colleagues on the project and then adding in sub consultants for some projects, which definitely adds a layer of com complexity. Um, so, you know, it's, I feel like I had a nice kind of slow ramp into, uh, complicated project management. Um, and I'd like to, I try as best as I can to, um, offer the same kind of gradual, uh, advancement into comp project management for the, the staff that are, uh, working with me as well. Um, and then the kind of people management um, I've just tried to make that a priority, especially when I became the director of my department and was thinking about what does this role mean? And it was kind of a, it was a new role. I'm like the, the one who's had it. We didn't really have that before. Um, so what does this mean? What does the, what's the definition of this role? Um, how is this different than project management? And, um, you know, honestly talking with colleagues, um, who are also managers uh, and even talking with my partner who works in tech, but they do a lot of one-on-ones and like touching base with people um, that has influenced me. And um, I think, you know, in a, in a good way. So I'm sure there are ways that I can continue to improve, but uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm trying. Mm -hmm. um, we're getting close to time here. So I'm going to ask this important question, Hope, which was on my list too, which is what's the most important piece of advice you would give to a graduate student looking to enter the field? Yeah, great question. Um, I think, uh, as we said, internships are important, but even asking for informational interviews just to learn and to shadow and to talk with people uh, who are in in the work um, or, you know, doing slightly different things within the broader fields of historic preservation, like talking to someone in a city planning department who's a preservation planner or um, in uh, um, in an environmental firm versus a firm like mine that's like planning and architecture and kind of getting a sense of all of that. My my feeling is that people are really generous with their time and want to encourage um, emerging professionals uh, in the field and will be happy to go out to coffee or have an informational interview or something like that. Um, so it doesn't ever hurt to reach out and see if you can just make connections and and networking helps too. Uh, so, you know, I think that kind of kills two birds with one stone. You're learning uh, and you're also starting to make those connections. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, I'm not gonna be able to get to all the rest of these questions and some of them are really good. So I'm sorry to anyone whose question wasn't answered but I will take these into consideration for as we're planning our next uh, talks in this series, we'll certainly think about the questions that you all are bringing up. Um, that next session is going to be on April 30th. We'll feature Laura Dominguez, who's a historian of race, heritage, and placemaking in the American West. And Christina, thank you so much for being so generous with your time and being willing to be our kind of like first person <laughs> in this new series. Thank we you. Really I know. I, I wish I we could have talked about all of these uh, questions as well. <laughs> I'm sad this is only an hour long. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and Lisa, did you wanna say any parting words from CPF? Yeah, thank you. Um, I just wanted to say, uh, you know, also thank you to Christina for taking the time to be with us today um, and reiterate our appreciation for your kind of being our guinea pig on this first uh, <laughs> inaugural run of, of today's program. Um, and to our audience, on behalf of myself, uh, the staff here at CPF, uh, our education co-chairs, um, we wanted to thank you again for joining us today. We do hope you enjoyed the program. Um, we welcome you to provide feedback, uh, both on this program, uh, who you might want to hear from in the future. Uh, when you close your Zoom window, you'll be redirected to a very brief survey um, where you can fill in that information. 
Um, again, we encourage you to become members. If you're not already, we do offer a two-year free student membership, um, which gives you access to our paid programs uh, free of charge. It gives you discounted access to our conference and other programs that we offer throughout the year. So we very much encourage you to check that out. Uh, I hope you all have a great rest of your afternoons, and we'll see you at our next Emerging Professionals program. Thank you. Thanks.